morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Peter Stark. Um, I'm head of investment for Angefeld in Germany and uh, managing director for the Berlin branch of Angefeld. I've been doing that for 10 years. Before we start the, the panel discussion here um, on residential, um, well, we look back uh, some 10, 12 years and uh, realize that uh, uh, the asset class residential was one of the most disliked asset classes in Germany. Why is that? Very little rent uh, increase, very intensive uh, property management, uh, little uh, appreciation in value. And uh, this was reason enough for pension funds and insurance companies to sell out on their large residential uh, stock that they, that they held. Now, uh, 10 years later, we know that they couldn't have been more wrong um, and I guess they know it themselves by now because they're buying back into the residential market. Um, this market has gone a substantial change over the last 10 years. I will try to explain what happened and why that is. Before I um, get onto the panel with uh, my colleagues, uh, let me just give you some brief uh, information uh, in general on Germany, where are we coming from, why we are, where we are right now, uh, also in comparison to other countries. Now you see that um, the unemployment rate in Germany in the early 2000s went up steep. Uh, we hit five million people here, whereas all the other countries actually were uh, uh, going, going down. Um, this is when uh, the uh, government under Schroeder at the time introduced the German labor market reform, also called uh, uh, known as Hartz IV. And as a result, the unemployment rate dropped significantly to an all-time low of uh, roughly 5.8% now, uh, whereas uh, you know Italy and France have missed the boat. They are now looking at 10 and 12% and uh, are about to set up those uh, reforms in the years to come. Now, as a result of that, the uh, nominal unit labor cost went also down. Again, this is the, the introduction of hard sphere, giving Germany a competitive edge in the world market. As a result, real estate prices also went up. And when looking at the volumes that we see for the last 13 years, we show uh, residential in red, commercial in blue, you see that we had a volume, this is asset and share deals together, uh, for, of about 40 billion euro in 2003. This is around the time when uh, Zaberos, the first opportunistic fund, entered the German market, buying the uh, state-owned housing company uh, GSW, which uh, last year went public and has now been taken over by Deutsche Wohnen. So they basically gave the signal and from there on the market really took off. Uh, peaked in 2006 and uh, 2007 with volumes of 110 billion euro and then the Lehman crisis with a sharp drop uh, all the way down to uh, under 40 billion in 2009 and then gradually coming out of the hole uh, and we're seeing um, in 2013 volumes of about 60 billion euro. So rest assured there is no bubble in Germany. Uh, there's a long way to go to hit these uh, volumes here, and we will discuss that a little further uh, when we get on the panel. Um, understanding Germany from abroad, well, it, we're organized and structured differently from, from, from many other countries. When you talk real estate in the UK, you look at London. When you talk real estate in France, you look at Paris. Well, in Germany, we have the big seven or the big five. When you hear that from north to south, we have Hamburg, we have Berlin. We have Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, and Munich. Those form the big five. And Cologne and Stuttgart uh, will add, make it the big seven. Now, obviously, there are many more cities, B cities of uh, uh, substantial size, 500,000 and more, which are not shown here and are not part of the big seven. We will also come to that on the panel. Um, what other parts of Germany, what other cities might be of interest? to investors when looking at the residential market. Just a quick run through what has happened in, in, with yields in Germany. The panel on logistics will elaborate on that. But just to show you where they're coming from, retail, this has come, come also from about 9% all the way down to a little over 7. 
um, office, there's more ups and downs here due to the market fluctuation. And residential, well, we see that the we see that the uh, uh, yields are now below five percent. Those are average yields that we see in the in the German market for residential. Um, a quick look at the rental situation. This is what uh, we looked at in 2000. Um, this is net rent per square meter and month. So in Berlin, four euro. Cologne, Düsseldorf, Stuttgart, Frankfurt, Hamburg, around six euro. And Munich was ahead of the game, was close to seven. Now, what has happened over the last 12 years, the rents in all cities have appreciated, have gone up. And uh, when you look at the percentages, you see that Munich is leading with some 47%, Hamburg 42, Berlin 41, Dusseldorf only appreciated by 13%. Interesting is that you know, in 2012, the rent roughly 580 on average in Berlin is what, what it was 12 years ago in Stuttgart, Dusseldorf, Frankfurt, and Hamburg. But this is probably one of the reasons why there's so much interest in Berlin, apart from being the capital city. Um, well, apart from the big seven, we just uh, looked at uh, the, the, the growing population in uh, selected cities. And interestingly enough, for the years 2011 and 2012, Leipzig actually was uh, leading with uh, some 3.7%, not being a big uh, seven city. Uh, before Munich and Frankfurt, Dresden, very interesting uh, uh, investment market uh, ahead of Berlin, Nuremberg. So you see there's other places when you look at population growth, which also is, uh, uh, goes along with most of the time with economic development, uh, places to look at when uh, looking at the German market. Um, the yield spread, well, Munich is the most expensive uh, part in, in, in Germany when it comes to residential. Berlin is a little over. I guess in 2013 we will uh, see yields coming down here as well. Now the yield spread for Hanover, also a city of some 500,000 people, Leipzig or Dresden. So it's almost 300 basis points between Munich and, uh, and Dresden. So how is the market developing? We're looking at the uh, population of house and household development in Berlin for the years 2003 to, to 12, you see that the population has gone quite a bit and uh, the households at the same time, 80% uh, of the households are being occupied by one or two persons in Germany, in particular in the big cities. So um, when we look at the uh, uh, development for, for the future, this is still Berlin, uh, we see some 200,000 households to be added or expected until 2013. So within the next 17 years, there's a tremendous uh, demand for uh, for space, hitting a market that's pretty much empty. There is no vacancy in the Berlin residential market. Um, and, oops, well, there's one missing, sorry. Um, in in uh, Germany, we're expecting the households to grow uh, over the next 12 years by another 730,000. So the big picture, Germany is uh, a strong market, is in very high demand of many investors, and um, I would like to invite my colleagues now to the panel and uh, get on with the uh, question. Um, I would like to ask you to just briefly, he has introduced himself already, Ralph, would you just uh, sure. do sure. a quick introduction? Sure. My name is Ralph Kind. I'm a managing partner of Dr. Lübke and Kelber, that is a owner-managed real estate operating platform in Germany. We have 60 people on the ground operating through six offices. But for those of you who've spotted that I'm also wearing a different name on my badge, that's right, I'm I also have a second hat on, and that is I'm a board member of Aberio Capital, that is the affiliated investment manager of our platform. And uh, through Aberio, we are co-investing in transactions that we are sourcing and structuring for other people. 
Okay. Right. My name is Kai Schubert. I'm Director of International Client Management, working for 10 years now with Corpus Irio. Corpus Irio is the leading uh, third-party service provider in asset management in Germany, 10 locations, 560 people on the ground, managing roughly all in all 16.5 billion euros assets, uh, mainly focusing on office, residential, retail, and healthcare. Thank you. Yeah, um, I have first question to you. All, all big markets in Germany have approved uh, nicely over the last two, three years. For anybody like you planning to invest in Germany, is it still the right time to enter the market? General answer, yes. I think it's, um, that's not just because that's my business, but I genuinely believe it's only, it's only the beginning that we're seeing. And the reason for that is that it is a, a very strong sector in a strong market and it's structurally sound. I mean, the charts and the slides that you presented um, are outlining, let's say, the, the environment in which we are operating here. Rents are increasing at a reasonable pace. I mean, average probably two or three percent over the last 10 years. We have a um, very resilient occupier base. I mean, the average um, person or the average tenant has seen a real increase in wealth over the last years, so rents are still affordable. We have limited supply in terms of new construction and production um, developments uh, on the market. I mean, if you, for instance, pick out the listed real estate players, the residential real estate players, the guys like GSW and Deutsche Wohnen, their average value per square meter is probably around 900 euros. Now, the average replacement cost for such a building is between 1,500 and 2,000 euros a square meter. So, if you think that through, then economically it actually doesn't make any sense to develop new buildings if you then rent it out at five or six euros. It makes sense if you can rent it out at 10, 12, 14 euros, or you basically construct things which are earmarked for sale. And I think that we've gone through also a phase of increasing professionalism in, in Germany. I mean, players have become much more professional in terms of how they operate on the ground. Just take a look at the, at the listed um, sector. And I would, last but not least, I mean, the 5% yields that you've shown as an average, if you compare that to um, the 10-year um, yield of, of boons, which are 1.7%. We are talking 330 basis points premium between government bonds and um, residential. So I think that in, in summary, it's a it's a safe place to invest uh, for investors. Thank you, uh, Kai. You're working with international clients. Um, what are they um, investing in? What have they been lately looking at? What is their strategy? Which cities are they preferring for their investments? Well, actually, over the last uh, several years, it well, started in 2002, 2003, with the first international investors investing in residential real estate in Germany. And over the, over the periods of time, there were different attitudes and different strategies that uh, were successful. Um, what, I, what I would like to point out is one thing which is very, well, it's obvious, but it's very striking. Uh, Germany is the federal state, so it is totally different to, from the structure-wise to France and, and England, for example. Um, the, the federal structure of Germany um, gives the opportunity to not invest in one hub. So what Charles just mentioned in his, uh, in his first statement, that coming from the Expo Berlin, residential Berlin, Berlin and residential was, were the key notes. Um, this is something that you have to bear in mind that it's it's not just one city, it is not just the top five or top seven cities which are really interesting for real estate, especially for residential investments in Germany, but the federal structure which is a long, a long, uh, has been over a long period of time, the fact in Germany indicates that, that investing in regional prosperous areas is a very good strategy to, to, strategy to apply. So for example, if you see international investors who are 
<coughs> from France or from England who are used to some centric um, situation in their country got to know the situation or they, they, um, uh, they understood part and part the situation that in Germany there is a possibility to go in different areas and to really find very stable and prosperous markets within throughout the country. So this is something that for, for international investors um, who are first focused on the top five or top seven then come to, this, to, the, to the idea and to the solution that it's not just the top five where you do have a very uh, a lack of supply, where you do, everyone is looking for, this, uh, for these areas. And so the strategy to go uh, in, the, in the federal structure of Germany is something that more and more investors uh, really apply. You have six offices in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. Five of those six are in the big city. Mm -hmm and one is in Dresden, probably for good, yeah. for good reason. Um, now, as an investor coming from abroad, coming from England or elsewhere, why would they, what would you tell them, why should they invest in Dresden rather than in Stuttgart or, or Düsseldorf? Because you probably get better returns for a similar risk profile. And it's actually nice that you're pointing to Dresden. Um, yes, it's the office which is outside the big seven definition, but i give you a real case study. Um, we are managing roughly 4,000 residential flats in Berlin and Dresden for a very large Scandinavian institutional investor. And we've been doing that for a couple of years. Initially, they approached us and said, here are 200 million equity, go and find the right product. So we defined the investment criteria and we've on purpose also chosen Tristan because even though it's smaller than Berlin and some of the other locations, it has a very sound structure and, and demand and supply. And a debt-free city. And a debt-free city. One of two in Germany. Also a function of a very large transaction that happened somewhere couple of years ago. But the point is, so we, we bought these 4,000 units and we've been asset managing uh, since then for, for those institutional uh, clients. And in Dresden, um, the net, net, net cash return that we're generating for this investor, and that's a pure equity investment. So they have refrained from putting any leverage on that. They've also refrained from any trading. It's a pure buy and hold. And once in a while you optimize, it's 6.1%. <coughs> so that's the bottom line. Now, try to achieve that in a market like Frankfurt or Hamburg or Munich. It's probably impossible. At least if you, if you leave leverage and other um, tricks outside the equation. So there's probably more than Dresden, more cities like Dresden. Like Le when you look at Leipzig, when you look at, should there be a difference between Leipzig and, and, and Hanover, for example, cities of, of equal size? Yeah. Uh, the, the industry has grown in, in Leipzig. I mean, it's the car manufacturing. There is a chip industry yes. there's between Leipzig and Dresden. So it's kind of a strong area in the eastern part of the new Bundesland. Um, that, that, that's right, and I, I think I mean we've we've heard already on the panel on your discussions. Let's not just focus on the capital. You have big sevens. I I, I would say you have you have seventy seven zero cities in Germany with more than a hundred thousand inhabitants spread across the country. So cities like Dresden or even go smaller. I mean uh, Erlangen, for instance, uh, or other cities. Names might not say anything to you right now, but the point is, it's a very diversified, granular market, and there are places where you can generate above average yield for a very safe product. But the point is, um, you probably can't source and definitely not manage that product on a, let's call it, fly-in, fly-out basis. You, you, need, you need the people on the ground. Um, who are able to scout the product for you to uh, make the transactions and then, very importantly, to manage the real estate. 
The new German government is in the midst of uh, you know, forming the coalition, so there's still talks between the uh, Social Democrats and the Christian Union. They're about to uh, uh, finalize that within the next four or six weeks. But there are already talks um, that uh, concern the, the residential real estate uh, arm quite a bit. Uh, amongst others, there are plans to limit the rent for new lease agreements to a maximum of 10% over the rental table, or Mietspiegel for that matter, if that um, is, is, is a term that, that, that you're familiar with. Um, and then the, the next thing is um, on existing lease agreements, um, you should be allowed to increase that only by 15% over four years. No, Rainer, what do you think, what are the chances that uh, something like that is coming through? And uh, can we expect more poisonous stuff from, from this coalition that is about to start at the beginning of next year? Well, I think uh, sometimes the good intention does not necessarily result in the good results. So what, what does this coalition want to do? They want to stabilize the market, they want to stabilize the rents, and yet at the same time sort of uh, motivate, motivate investments. And that's exactly what you see in, in what, what they, well, not deliberately, but they, what, what obviously has leaked from, from their negotiations the, the last couple of days, that they're looking particularly on uh, what we would probably see at the big seven cities or what they define as markets where the rental situation is close, where, where it's uh, tough to get a new flat, for those who are not sort of fortunate to to um, earn sort of high income. And there is a tendency that they will allow the uh, federal states to declare certain cities as areas where it's difficult to get a flat, and that they propose two, two basic measures in those um, areas. One is that they will uh, allow digressive uh, depreciation <laughs> again for a five-year period for those periods. For, sorry, for those areas. On new buildings. On new buildings. And also, simultaneously, only in those defined zones, they will sort of um, uh, put on what, what is called in German the rental break, uh, Mietbremse, um, on, um, on existing leases as well as on new leases. Also, what they are trying to do, just to add that, is... Um, they are considering to amend the Mietenspiegel from a four-year um, from a four-year perspective to a ten-year one. That, that's probably a very sort of uh, hard discussion which will come up within the next couple of months, because I think it seems very clear that also, even though this is the current status of the negotiations, some of the politicians have realised what I said as an initial statement that not everything that's meant is to be good will have good results. As we see the investment in flats, uh, particularly in Berlin and other cities, uh, raising now and, and sort of as an immediate response to, to, shorten, uh, to a short offer in, in certain areas. So the market is reacting and whether or not sort of one will understand that it should be a separate issue to have one kind of the market for everyone and a social housing market and subsidies for those who um, who sort of have other income and to protect sort of the population which is currently living in a certain defined area is a completely different thing than declaring the whole city of Berlin as as an area where it's, where it's tough to get a flat because that's simply not true. And the fact that it's simply not true will also lead to discussions as to whether these uh, decrees or ordinances have a legal basis. So, yes, there is a certain status of discussion. Yes, the coalition will do something in that area, but how it will look like in the end, I think it's still open. Some, one thing is for sure, they will look at the energy efficiency and they will further it. They will uh, put more subsidies in that area. Um, and, and what the rest will be, we'll have to see, but we'll have to calculate with some, a little bit of a, a rental break as well. Now, I, I need to pick on this point again. 15% increase over four years, that is almost 4% per year. This is, the inflation is at 2%. You know, you being a landlord, 
or representative or landlord? Does it really concern you? Well, actually, I think you have to see two points. One, Germany already has a, a legal system or some restrictions in residential. This is not a digital discussion or zero to one, but it's just a further step that we do face in the, in the restrictions of rental increases. Um, nowadays, we have a restriction which is uh, generally all, all over Germany, uh, which is some 20% over three years. Now we will have in these hubs some regulations on rental increases over a four-year years period of time. If you remember the, the, uh, the, the chart that uh, Peter was putting on in, in regards to the rental increase in the cities over the last 12 years, uh, the peak was something around 50% in Munich. In Munich. So on a 12 years basis, you have the 4%. So for a long-term investor, from my point of view, even these this restrictions in, in raising rents uh, or raising the rental table um, is, or raising, raising rents to the rental table is something which is on a short-term basis might infect, infect your, the calculation. Um, <laughs> no panic. <laughs> And um, so, so over a long period of time, a holding period of time, this is something that, from my point of view, is not as, as important as it's uh, been, uh, been mentioned. Um, on the other side, we do have some, some issues on, or some, some regulations on new leases that might affect uh, the, the, the market a bit more or the calculation a bit more. But remember, we are just talking about the hub areas. So if you're investing in Berlin or in Munich or in Hamburg, this will be a situation that you will face. From my point of view, and as I already mentioned, there are some, so many other opportunities in Germany to approach other markets where it is vital to have the local knowledge and residential especially is a, is a local business. When you do have the right, spotted the right areas, like, um, um, <clears throat> uh, like um, we, did, we did here in the first, uh, in the first presentation, you have, to, you have to think local, and when you, when you choose these areas, you're not facing any of, this, uh, of these further restrictions. And so from my point of view, it's just a matter of calculation. Um, if, you, if you think of uh, um, um, that it's on a, a short-term basis, residential, well, Germany is a safe haven, and residential in Germany is even a, a safe spot in the safe haven, which is so, um, so stable. So, just to have the idea for a, for a short-term investment and sh short in and out uh, transaction profit, this is most probably, well, you can get it by chance, but this is not the right yeah. general idea to approach the German yeah. residential. We're coming to that point. Um, uh, the transaction cost um, um, you're facing uh, is around 12%, depending on the volume of the property. Now, uh, about 5% of those 12 uh, accounts for property transfer tax. And there are ways to, to circumvent that. Do you see with your clients, national and international clients, um, are they setting up structures to, like, like share deal structures to avoid the, uh, the property transfer tax? Oh, oh yes, uh, definitely. It's, it's not sort of uh, white and uh, black. Uh, share deals is, is <coughs> something you've, we have seen for, for many years. The big residential transactions I was advising on in the early years of the last decade. Uh, starting with Kiel, Salzgitter, Viterra, etc., they have all been um, they have all been share deals. You always want to distinguish between who is the investor, who upon exit will invest in that sort of asset. If you want to sell a very local building, it will certainly not be a Cayman or Luxembourg or whatever uh, share deal structure you'll offer. And you'll also have to bear in mind that's a different product. You buy then a corporate shell with this history. The depreciation, wherever it stands, there's some red saving. There may be a, a, um, um, a latent capital gains, which you have to take into consideration. But yes, investors are responding. And one thing is new due to the amended real estate transfer tax laws. Probably they will not as much as in the past invest into transparent structures because you can't exit them without real estate transfer tax. But the corporate structures, let's see how that sort of evolves. <clears throat> Thank you. Now, given the cost structure of roughly 12%, um, a simple buy and hold strategy is probably 
well, I wouldn't say outdated, but should the investors not be a little bit more aggressive? Um, maybe also go on a parallel basis, build up a, a holding a portfolio and have a trading portfolio? What would you advise? Um, well, it depends on the objectives of the investor, clearly. I Give, mean, given a yeah, I mean, longer we're, term horizon. Uh, well, exactly. I mean, we're not talking about a homogeneous pool of capital. We have very diversified structure of investors. Um, we closed one deal um, in um, early October for a very uh, a large international family office located here in, in London, and they acquired uh, 160 million of flats in, in Berlin. And they're not interested in actually selling it because they want to keep this real estate exposure long term. And by long term, we're not talking about a eight year business plan instead of five years. They're talking in terms of decades or even generations. So they're interested to keep that. But you're right, for other investors, it absolutely makes sense. And, and I believe that um, bifurcating your real estate, your residential portfolio into a hold portfolio and then a trading portfolio actually is a, n a very neat way to um, improve the economics. Because if, for instance, you have a 30% trading portfolio of your of your real estate stock, then there you can get much higher returns and, and, and profits rather than just buy and hold. Um, one of my partners has been doing that very successfully for DWS, a very large investor fund investor in Germany, and we've set up a number of funds on that basis. So any portfolio that we bought, we at, at the point when we started the uh, due diligence and then the actual acquisition, we've put that into pocket A or B, i.e. It's, it's a buy and hold or it's a trading portfolio. But again, the point is, in order to do that operationally, I mean, it all sounds very nice on a spreadsheet level if you sit somewhere in front of your computer and you can do the, the economics and, and, and the formulas. But I think that the real challenge is to, to do that in practice with the people on the ground. You need to have the processes, the systems, you need to have the distribution people selling flats uh, house by house, flat by flat, or portfolios. Yeah, but you know what I don't understand when, when people come to us investors, they all look at obviously the same product in Berlin. Um, they set themselves a hurdle of maybe three million and wouldn't look at anything uh, uh, smaller than that. Now, most of the houses are a million five to, to 2.5. So they're kicking themselves out of the market just by setting the, the, the wrong uh, investment uh, framework. And by checking offers, they look for the ideal property. And at the same time, they come across so many other properties that there are still good properties. They just don't fit the, the, the very tight uh, criteria. Now, there are so many synergies by, by doing the holding strategy and at the same time uh, uh, maybe investing in a, in a in a trading portfolio, but this is something that we would like to see happening more more often. You certainly get support from a tax lawyer because that's tax efficient. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now um, the banks are playing a, a major role, as we all know. Um, uh, they have taken a much more conservative approach after the Lehman crisis. Um, we are looking in Germany at LTVs of 70 to 75 percent. In the residential market, that is um, that is uh, standard. Uh, Ralph, do you see the banks uh, loosening up on their on their lending practice in in light of the, uh, yeah, the money floating around uh, and, and and looking for a haven to be invest? I mean, this is uh, something that could also fuel the market uh, even further. No, that's that's right. It's a typical criteria for for a bubble if you have excessive debt. So the quantity of debt increases and the quality of debt decreases, but um, we're not seeing that in Germany. And I have to say, I, I used to be an investment bank for many years based here in London and doing structured finance deals in, in Germany. So I think I, I understand the joke of uh, modeling a portfolio and talking to rating, agen uh, rating agencies and so forth. But from my conversations with, um, with the banks on the ground, on mandates that we have and deals that we're doing, a reasonable approach. I mean, yes, 70, 75, sometimes you get 80% loan to value. And I mean, we can discuss the V within the LTV 
equation for many hours and who is right and who is wrong, what, what's the value? I think one of the things that, that the bankers have learned um, is actually the focus on cash flow. So instead of just focusing on LTV metric, um, people have realized that it is the cash flow that, that is actually the most important thing and enhance um, things like interest coverage ratio, uh, debt service coverage ratios, debt yields, etc. are very important. But clear answer, I, I don't see any excessive behavior or loosening up or covenant light structures. Um, German residential is a very interesting um, area for German banks. They love it because they can put it into their covered bond pool, Deckungsstock, and, and issue Pfandbrief and all those sort of things. So it's great. It's a good competition, but I think it's still at a very healthy level for the overall sector. I get the signal. <coughs> we have time for two more quick uh, questions and even shorter answers. Um, the, the banks are they have to, to shorten their balance sheets due to the Basel III restrictions. Now, a lot of investors got in the markets in 2006, 2007, investing and, and, and financing for six, seven years, some for 10. So this comes up for prolongation. The banks that they have been financing with, some of them are not even in existence anymore or are just um, you know, being, uh, well, being bought out like Eurohypo. Do you see that being a, a problem for, well, first of all, for the investors finding new financing? And if they don't find, they may have to sell. Could that put pressure on the prices? Well, actually, if you, if you see what happened over, the, the, over recent years, there was not in residential, there was not too, too much of, uh, of the situations going on. The banks were more or less uh, well, refinancing or... or uh, uh, just prolonging the, the situation. So we didn't have too many of these situations in the past. And we'll have a panel afterwards on, on, on this in this regard. And, and I'm really uh, interested to hear what, what the, these specialists are saying about, about that situation. I'm pretty sure that there will be some, some further products to come and uh, that there will be situations to invest in. Residential actually is not the, the specific area because it's so stable which is um, a matter to, uh, to, the, um, well, to problems in financing situations. The banks are, are really active in, in financing, and this, by this you can see that the banks are really relying on the German residential real estate market. They've, they've, it's not just the German banks, but also foreign banks who like to, to finance German residential real estate. So this is, this is a safe thing to do. And, but what the banks look at is who is doing the management, who is working on that, and not just only on your business plan and on your Excel sheet, but they, are, they have learned, this is the learn curve that uh, we also learned in the, uh, in the first discussion or in the first presentation, they have learned that it's, it's vital to, to have the, an in-place asset management and property management, and that you really have to have people on the ground, and with our clients and the deals that we've uh, that we source for our clients in residential. Uh, we, we are very comfortable with the situation of financing for our clients, and we are, uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the 10 office, we are working on the ground in the local areas of residential <coughs> real estate. Thank you. So, to finish off, getting the red card here, uh, <laughs> three good recommendations for investors who are planning to buy residential real estate in Germany. Very quick. From observation, do not invest in herds. I heard a terrible sentence just a few days ago, which is, uh, I'd rather lose money investing with a pack than making money on my own. That's probably then your market to do it different. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good point. I only add two more. Um, I think um, look at B cities good location within the smaller cities and then also not only do the due diligence on the real estate, also do the due diligence on the asset manager and the property manager on the ground because those are the guys who are actually able and uh, in, in the driving seat to deliver the cash flows that, that you're promising. Okay. Yeah, prosperous regional uh, markets in Germany are the places to invest in, in residential. This is my point of view. and. Uh, for now five years, we've done a survey, to, uh, a survey together with uh, a, a big company, um, which led us to uh, 20, Germany 21. These are the 21 cities that we right. think that 
sorry, three recommendations. Well, okay, 21, 21 recommendations for, uh, for investing in Germany. So uh, this, is, this is the places which are really interesting to invest in. Okay, on my part, look for experienced partners on the ground. You've met some of them. Look for smaller deals. Don't go always for the big deal because it might be easier. And on the last account, pay the broker well. It pays off in the long run. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs>